Hi everyone, my name is Minan Koke and welcome to Owning Business YouTube channel. On today's video, we're going to be streaming an event that was hosted by the CEO of Women in Business, Unopilo Kumete at Fire and Vine. And we'll be touching on issues such as mental health and women's health as in the month of October, we were dealing with wellness. So just enjoy the video as you're growing in your business. If you want to know how to become a member of Women in Business, you can just click on the link. Um, this is available in the description box. Or if you want to learn more about this community, just click on the link and it will direct you to our website. Enjoy the video. So my name is Nombilo Kumede, um, the CEO, and I'd like to welcome you, feel welcome, and I love what you've been doing, connecting, because I believe in networking, because networking makes us know one another, and I've, I've seen that people buy things from people they know, so we must know one another in order to support one another, because some of us don't actually have main businesses, but we've got, um, we're also working, so... Hashna must, might know something that I don't know and teach me and groom me. We also have mentorship programs. We've got a lot that's happening for us as women and we should be the ones to rely on one another in order to rise to a higher place. So, welcome, feel free, you can order and uh, our program is going to start now. We're going to start with the main thing, the mind. Women's health is also important. I'd like to just introduce our speakers. I'm sure you've seen them or seen them on our social media platforms. We've got Anele Ndlovu. Can you please clap hands for her? And we've got Dr. Mama Asu Gorente. We're so thankful that you guys could just take time off and just be with us today, just to empower us as women, because really we need to be mentally well and we also need to be well in our um, in our women's health you know we've got a lot of questions for you, both of you because we really want to grow and be our best selves I, re I believe in us as women living our best lives so that's my welcome feel free let's relax let's have breakfast let's have coffee let's just relax it's a Saturday and let's unwind and let's get as much information as we can because if we don't continuously improve then we're dying so let's do this Yay. Good morning again, ladies. Um, as Unompilo has said, my name is Anne Lenzovu, and I am joining you today as a mental health advocate and also a member, newly joined member of Women in Business. I think it's been two months now. Yes. Um, so I'm very, this is my first event actually, as of, yeah, my first Women in Business event. So it's quite nerve wracking that I'm joining and I'm also speaking. <laughs> But thank you so much for having me. Um, I have a poem that I'd like to share with you as we begin um, my talk on mental health. The poem is called, I am mental illness. My name is mental illness. I have been around since man was created. Many different names have been given to me. In the past, <coughs> Looney, Nata, village idiots, and so forth were used by society to describe who I am. In modern times, I have become sophisticated. I am now labeled depressive, manic, obsessive, and schizophrenic by people who have not lived with me to know my capabilities. You have a life that you think you own, but I would like to remind you, when I strike, I pay no regard to who you are or what you have achieved in society. I take you rich or poor, I take you beautiful or ugly, regardless of color or creed. Fame will not protect you from my reach. It is only a matter of time. I know no boundaries. You have gathered here today to promote awareness of my destructive power, but also how I can be conquered. I would like to reassure you, I can be conquered, but only if you find the key to unlock my mystery, which is within you. The key is that it is okay for you to tell others that I have come to live with you without your permission, that I am a pain to live with. I've brought you stigma. I've taken away who you are and your dreams for the future. I've given you a new identity. But do not lose hope. Remember, I can be conquered. Consistent, unconditional love expressed in a genuine manner will lessen my sting. 
when I am in residence with you. Do not judge those whose lives I have claimed until you have walked in their shoes. Be mindful to the needs, hopes, and dreams of those who live with me, for I could be with you tomorrow. So I, um, whenever I read this poem, I always find it so powerful and that it really allows us to be more empathetic to mental illnesses and to people who live with a mental illness or who have mental health um, disorders or issues. And before I get into, so what I like to do, um, Nombilo knows, and I think Hashna as well, is for us just to quickly go around the room and just mention one way that you feel you prioritize or protect your mental health. So it can be anything. It can be praying, it can be running, it can be gym, it can be reading, whatever it is, so that we just have an idea. So I like this because you can find other ways that you can protect and prioritize your mental health. So we'll start here. And if you can just say your name and how you prioritize your mental health. Hi, I'm Amaso and I like to go for walks in nature. Hi, I'm Hashna and uh, I like to dance. Put loud music on and I dance. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josette. Um, I like to talk to myself in the car when I drive to work. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nondi. Um, I like to exercise. Hi, my name is Debra. Uh, I think I like more this. Hi, I'm Nondi. I, I think I like exercising and TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you say that very quietly? <laughs> 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 I'm Nondi. I I'm Sharice and I'm with Hashna. I think we should get together and dance sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi, yes. I'm on the road. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kizet and I like to listen to music. Hi everybody, my name is Nonto Bego. I like escaping and with my books and I read. Hi, my name is Tabisile. I don't work on Mondays. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Let's move this side. Um, I like exercising, but I also see a therapist every now and then just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ladies, yeah. Can we please, can you guys, um, would you like to share as uh, the introduction from um, Anele? What do you do for your mental health? Yeah, to prioritize your mental health. To prioritize your mental health. Thank you. Okay, did you hear that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. I mean, I'm Londera. I think I like exercising and a good laugh with you. I enjoy company. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there are other ladies on oh, Zoom as well. Also... Sandy, would you like to say something or do you guys prefer writing in the... Uh, in, in the chat box. Okay, maybe if they tell me in the chat box, th yes. th there's quite a few of them. Okay, Linda? Hi, I'm Linda and I love reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Minenke and I prefer talking about it. Yay, thank you, thank you. So that was a form of networking, getting to know each other and also who you can connect with. We have a lot of exercise and gym fanatics and working out we have readers we have dancers um so maybe you guys can get together you know and talk more about the different things that you do to prioritize your mental health so i usually get asked um how i became a mental health advocate and i'm a self-appointed mental health advocate there's a lady whose book i just love reading and she says the best people to talk about mental illness and mental health are those who live with a mental illness and you know who suffered some sorts of mental unwellness and what i'd like to show you today is my journey um my mental health journey so 
I believe I, I come from a family that is very open to therapy. I've had siblings who've also been depressed, had some postnatal depression. So I was, a very, I was very aware of mental illnesses. But until I faced all of this, did I really get to know more about mental illnesses sure. and mental health? You know, um, so I, I, I am a person who, who used to, because now I've changed, <laughs> but my work, my career, my job, the companies I worked for, job titles, positions, that's how I identified myself with. That was my reputation. You couldn't tell me about my job. You couldn't tell, you know. So being retrenched <laughs> and being told that my role has become redundant completely threw me off. You know, I was like, how could I, no ways, like, I can't, I know, I've, you know, I, I'm in marketing and branding and I've worked, started marketing departments from scratch for organizations, built brands. How is it that you're telling me that I'm losing my job? And, you know, so I got retrenched, went through a, went through all this, all this, all this, to a point where I just couldn't anymore. And I was already seeing like a psychologist at that time. Um, my, my medical doctor had prescribed um, antidepressants and sleeping pills for me. This is around April, May last year. And at the end of May, it just got too much. And I drank 60 of my sleeping pills. Yeah, here at home, um, in my parents' home. And I don't know how my mother, like usually my, my doctor had said, um, take my sleeping pill at eight and then I must be in bed. So my whole family knew, you know, eight o'clock, um, so I've taken my pill and I'm going to sleep. So no one would bother me and until the next morning when I woke up to take my antidepressants and all that. So I knew that by the time they find me, it will be too late. But that day, I don't know how my mother decided she was gonna come and check on me. And that's when she found me and she saw, I guess, the, the bottles of the sleep of the pills um, on the dressing table. And they rushed me to the hospital and I was in the hospital for about um, three, three, four days. And that's when um, I saw a psychiatrist while I, while I was admitted. Um, and then she advised that I need to actually be admitted in a psychiatric hospital. So I was in a hospital um, in Howick, it's called Ortlands, and I spent two weeks there, and that's when the healing and the recovery journey started. And being there, you know, I always say that, even with the CCMA process and all that, I was like, okay, you know what they say, everything happens for a reason, God chooses you for these different parts and things <clears> like that, and I was like, there must be something that I have to do about this journey of mine, mm. you know? Um, especially because there's, we were talking about stereotypes, you being um, an agricultural engineer, we're like, you don't look like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I learned through being admitted and going through this whole process that there's a stereotype of the kind of person who has a mental illness. We all think it's the person who's on the streets, who, is eating from the bin, begging for money, and things like that. But that, like the poem, that's why I identify so much with that poem, because it's not that, it can be anyone. Rich, poor, clever, whatever. And I then said, I want to use my experience to shine more lights on mental illness and that it can happen to anyone. Because people are like, how could I try and take my life? I come from a good home, I, you know, I was living in Joburg. I travel overseas once a year on holiday with friends around Africa, around South Africa. How is it that someone like me could actually want to take their life? But it becomes too much. You know, it was, I felt like I was a financial burden, emotional burden on my family. And for me, at that point, I thought I was helping them out. Because if I'm not alive, then they don't have to worry about me. They don't have to see me drinking my life away because that's how I started to cope is with alcohol you know and they would worry am i gonna come home am i not gonna come home am i going to drive drunk or whatever it is you know 
And I thought I was helping my family out by taking my life so that I would not be a burden anymore. And that's what a lot of people who, like suicide is, they say it's the final, final kind of, when you get to that point, you feel nothing can help you in either your schizophrenic, your manic, or your depressive state. This is the only thing that you think can help take away this pain that you are in, you know? And I've been there. I know when someone is suicidal, it's because they just don't see another way out. And so I, I and being in, being in the psychiatric hospital, I, I saw that a lot of people hadn't told their families and friends that they were admitted. There were 21 of us. Um, and I found, how do they then get that support? Because everybody knew that I was in the hospital. I told everyone. You know, I told all my friends, and I asked for them to support me, to pray for me, to pray for my healing. My family knew. It was during COVID, so we couldn't get visitors. But I was just like, no one can come and see me, but please just check on me from time to time. Know this is what I'm going through. And I'll give them updates on what we are doing, what we have learned, and things like that. But a lot of people that I was admitted with had not spoken to their families, had not spoken to their friends. They just said they're taking leave, and a lot of people didn't know where they were. And that, because of the stigma, you know? And that's what led me also to, to talk more about my experience so that people could feel free to talk to others and get that support. Because it's very difficult having to deal with either being bipolar or depressed and having anxiety and then having no one that you can talk to or having no one that can take you to therapy or take like get your pills for you and things like that. So I was like, I really want to use, God has chosen me and God knows I talk a lot, you guys know that now. <laughs> I walked in here and I think my mouth was already going and going. But I was like, there's a reason why then he was like, you, you, you are going to be the person that I'm going to use because I know you're not going to sit with it in a corner and even if you're getting the healing, you're going to use your story and your journey to help other people get the healing because you're not shy to talk about it. You know, and I, I, I talk, a lot of people are like, so I'm not working. I work on my own organization that I've started called The Tea with Anil and Lovu, and it's basically around mental health advocacy. It's around women empowerment, women leadership, and that's how I met Unum Pilo and some of the ladies here. Um, and someone said to me, if you keep writing about this on your LinkedIn, companies are not going to hire you. And I'm like, well, then I'm not supposed to work for those companies. Because I can't keep quiet. People are suffering alone because they feel they are alone. But if they can read what I've written on my socials or hear me speak at um, events like this, it will help them get the healing that they need to get, even if they start off on their own. So I was like, well, it's too bad for that company. I'm great, so I do great work. But if they don't want me, it's okay. I'll keep doing what God has asked me to do and God has instructed me to do, which is to help heal people and to serve people through my journey and through my story. So this is how I then became the self-appointed mental health advocate. And I asked, um, I asked all of you to share how you prioritize your, your, your mental health. Because for me, it's very important. Sure. For me, it's, it's really important to know what gives you peace. Yes, we can take, uh, I'm still on medication. I'm still on antidepressants. Um, I'm sleeping better now, so I'm probably going to get off the sleeping pills, but I won't stop the antidepressants um, because they help me, you know, stay calm. I go to therapy every week. Um, but there are other things that help me stay calm, that help bring stability and peace into, like, mentally and also just physically. So it's important, um, besides the medical part of um, managing and treating your mental health, is what brings you peace, what brings you joy, what brings you calmness to do that? And that's why I asked you to share what you do because a lot of the times we also don't think that going to gym is time for me and it's time that I'm working. It you know, brings calmness to my mind, it brings calmness to my body. Yes, it's gonna make my body feel good, but it also works for your mind. Dancing, reading, you think you just love reading, but it's your time to you. And that's important for your healing, for your peace of mind. You know, so what I, um, 
the way I have prioritized and continue to prioritize my mental health, I've divided into kind of four segments. It's intention, it's my faith, it's going back to basics, and it's adopting and maintaining healthy habits. So with intention, it's if you know something is wrong with you, and if you know you're feeling a bit off, you know yourself, you know, um, be intentional and deliberate about seeking help. You know, so for me, I'm a very, I like walking, you know, um, I can't do gym. I feel sorry for those who go to gym, but gym is boring. Being in those, I just, just boring for me. So I prefer to walk or jog outside. I love reading. I read all the time. I write reviews of every book I read. Um, I like engaging like this, attending events, going out with friends. And just after my retrenchment and going through the CCMA process, I didn't want to do any of those things. I wanted to sleep the whole time. Um, I didn't walk. I didn't read. I didn't do anything. I didn't want to see people. I just wanted to be alone. And it took me about seven months after being retrenched to actually realize that I had stopped doing all the things that I liked doing. And then I knew something was wrong. But I hadn't given myself the time to really sit with that because I was like, I need to go through this process of CCMA, I need to win, um, you know. And I think maybe if I had taken stock of something is really off, I would have even been better prepared through that process. So you know yourself, then be intentional about seeking the help that you need. Talking to someone, um, finding out which therapists or counselors are around, um, what medication maybe you can be on, um, mood stabilizers, anti-anxieties, antidepressants, if you need to be on those, you know, go to your GP and tell them how you're feeling, then they can advise you if you need to be on medication or things like that. But being intentional and deliberate then helps you to take further steps in how to, to prioritize and protect your mental health. With my faith is, you know, um, I'm a church girl, I grew up in the church and I have always had a great relationship with God, but my strength and faith just gives me that hope that things will be better. My trust in God that, you know, I believe in God's promises. And God did say the storms will form, the weapons will form, you know, but it's, you won't be, like one of my favorite verses is Psalm 23 verse 4, I think, as I walk through the valley. You walk through. You don't stay, you might be, it might be a long and deep valley and you might be in it for two, three, four, ten years, but you're going through it. You know, there is light somewhere and the lights will shine. It's trusting that God will take you out of it. You know, I, I read the Bible twice, three times a day. I am really involved in my church, um, in activities around church and things like that. And that just helps me with my peace of mind as well. And then going back to basics, it's coming back to Marisburg. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's why I keep asking, you live in Marisburg, you work in, because I'm just like, why yeah. do people do that? <laughs> <laughs> but I, home has always been Marisburg, you know, I was born here, went to everything until varsity, I went to UK, and then in Durban, and then I moved to Joburg, and I lived in Joburg for 11, 10, 11 years, until last year when um, everything was going haywire, I came back home, and for me, that's going back to basics and it's actually worked out I did not think it would work out but being in Maritzburg has Maritzburg being the sleepy hollow really it is <laughs> but it has helped just center me as well because nothing happens so <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm offending it no I'm not sorry <laughs> but then I don't have to I feel like I need, yes, you know, I don't feel like I have to attend this, I have to do this exactly, you know. So, but uh, there are things that, Marisburg does have things that happen, it's just, at the time, I needed nothing to happen, so that I can actually focus just on getting better. So, there were no birthday parties, or kids parties, or this, or this, or this, that filled my calendar in Joburg. Here, yes, there were family events and things like that, but I really then got a chance to really focus on my healing, to really focus on my recovery. Um, so that's the going back to basics. The last point is adopting and maintaining healthy habits. 
so I walk um, I try to walk every day and literally two to three kilometers if I've done really well it's five kilometers but I don't want to like overexert myself because I still want to enjoy the walks I still want to enjoy being out in nature so two to three kilometers a day and yeah I literally walk as if I'm walking in a shopping center I'm not brisk walking I walked past your area I walk and I'm listening to Sarah Jakes Roberts or T.D. Jakes or Joyce Meyer or Tore Rob whoever it is and I'm just walking or I'll return calls if I have missed someone's call you know but just being in touch with the universe on that level for me um, it does something for my soul does something for my spirit and then I journal so I literally journal <laughs> not journal on my phone or on my tablets or anything but there's just something about the motion of writing that also just releases emotions and what I found as well is we don't only have to journal about the negatives or the bad emotions or the um, negative emotions that we're feeling even when I've had a good day I'm like yes today I walked 3.5 kilometers you know I did so well <laughs> You know celebrate myself because that also makes me happy you know it gives me joy to say wow yesterday i did this and today i was able to do this better than i did yesterday and what else reading i make time to read every night i tell myself i will read 30 minutes or an hour or 90 minutes before i go to bed so and my my psychologist used to say that that try not to be on your phone an hour before you go to bed um, just read or listen to something but don't be actively on your phone so I use my bedtime um, as reading time you know sometimes I sleep at 11 sometimes I sleep at half past 11 so by 10 I'm getting ready for bed and I'm sitting there with a book and I read until I fall asleep so that's also worked out what is the other thing I have forgotten but it's yeah walking oh something that I, I learned last year <laughs> Is setting boundaries I was very bad at that in my work I was perfect I set boundaries with bosses with whoever with whoever colleagues but in my personal life I struggled you know because I thought oh no it's gonna hurt someone if I don't do this um, and through therapy and just through my recovery process I learned that a lot of the stress I was causing myself and the anxiety I was causing myself was due to not having boundaries for people so i would say yes 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 i was a people pleaser basically because i'm like oh shame if i don't say yes to this then that person is going to either be upset or something's not going to work out for them um so i need to always say yes and that was to my detriment you know so that was something it's it's still a bit difficult um but it's something that is also a habit a, a healthy habit that i've had to learn to say no i can't do this or i can do it later is it important is it life-threatening and if it's not but is it life-threatening to me or to the other person if i feel it's to my detriment i really can't do it and it's been difficult because people who are so used to you saying yes 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 and when you suddenly say sorry not now or later um then you have an attitude <laughs> you know you have an attitude uh, you're not helpful and you think but I've been helping you for the past 30 years one time I've said I can't you're not helpful you are selfish yes. you know but it's been to my benefit because then I'm not over exerting myself I'm not stressing myself out um, and they've just had to come on board um, you know there are people who had stopped talking to me because of that but now they're slowly coming back and we're rebuilding those relationships you know because it's not I'm saying no completely but it's do we really have to do it now can I do it do I have the capacity to do it if I don't maybe let's look at something else that we can help you with you know but try it's hard but do try and with the recovery just in closing um, I need to be honest and say you will fall off the wagon <laughs> But it's okay, we need to just get back. It really was inspirational. And I'm so happy that you spoke about that because my topic is very much in line oh. uh, with this. <laughs> and I know with, for Nompilo, 
a theme for was it women in business is wellness for the for month of month. October. Yes. So I, I think it's very important that we do talk about these things. I've decided to have our conversation and I gave it a title. I've called it The Pause. <clears throat> the Pause. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one disclaimer, Nompido. Um, <clears throat> it's Mama so cranting pepper. My husband will be upset <laughs> that oh, I haven't added the pepper because that's his surname. Oh, but anyway, wow. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Pepra was your other name. No, no. Oh. Oh. So Mama Asu is your actual name? Mama Asu is my actual name. Wow. Yeah. I thought Mama Asu was just your nickname. Oh. Because maybe you have a child called Asu. Then... Oh. Let, let, let's have that talk. Okay. Let's have that talk. <laughs> okay, so the pause. I love medicine. I love it. I find the female human body fascinating. The fact that you can have a baby and 48 hours later, excuse me, your body looks like nothing has even happened is amazing. I have found it such a pleasure and an honor to be able to usher babies into this world. And I feel so blessed that women can share their deepest, darkest secrets with me and I can try to help them. It's so rewarding. Now, I'm a mother. I have two children. One is turning four next month, and the other is six months old. I am a wife. I've been married for the past 11 years. I'm an OBGYN, obstetrician and gynecologist, and I'm in private practice. I want to further my studies. I want to study more and I'll do it hopefully when my children are bigger. I want to educate more women. I want to lose five kgs. <laughs> so I've decided that I want to get a personal trainer so that they can motivate me to go to gym sorry I nearly five times a week. I want to be able to cook healthy meals for my family. Right. I want to get home early enough so that I can tuck my kids into bed and read them a story before they sleep. At my son's cake sales at school, I want to be able to bake the cake and not have to buy it. Girl, I feel you. <laughs> I want my kids to stop calling my nanny, mommy. Mama. <laughs> right? Right? Working woman. Okay, I want to always look good and fresh and young, mm. keep my husband interested, mm? <laughs> my partner interested, hey, so forth and so forth. And ladies, I know you can all attest to this. We want to do it all and have it all. Mm. And I used to do that a lot. I remember I used to stay in Joburg, Anele, <laughs> and moved to Peter Maritzburg in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> so when I started my practice, I got pregnant. And because the practice was new, I knew I couldn't really stay away from work for too long. So I decided that once I'd given birth, I would take six weeks off work and then get back to work. I remember I used to tell my patients that pregnancy is not an illness, that whatever you're going through, try to push through it. You should be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And with that ethos, I was saying, I need to walk that talk. Mm -hmm. So when I got pregnant, I had to be that poster girl, right? I used to wear high heels to work, <laughs> I worked until I was 39 weeks pregnant. I had a vaginal birth. I breastfed my son until he was one and a half years old. So I used to pump at work, put it in the fridge, huh? gave my baby breast milk the whole time. I 
when I finally gave birth, I went back to work after six weeks. I got my body back, minimal mm -hmm. effort, right? Superwoman. <laughs> okay. So imagine my disappointment when I had my second child and suddenly I felt so tired. It was a horrible pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I was nauseous all the time. I gained 30 kgs in pregnancy. My feet became so swollen that I had to substitute those high heels and wear Crocs <laughs> to work. Right? <laughs> Very different. <clears throat> I was so busy on that treadmill of success, pushing my practice. I got busier and busier. I had a six week waiting list before patients could come and see me. Right? success yeah but i was so busy so busy that i didn't notice that my kidneys had started to fail i didn't notice that my liver started to fail and that my blood pressure was so high that i could have had a stroke i didn't notice that my baby had stopped growing and that actually he was in distress. I was so busy on this treadmill of working and making money that I didn't notice, I didn't stop and take a breath to notice. That's my story, ladies. And I wanted to share it with you because I also want to share what I've learned from this experience. You know, as women, we are so busy and I'm talking working woman, we're so busy trying to prove to men that we are worthy to be working, mm. that when we have these kind of problems, we keep quiet, we try not to complain, we try to pop a pill, push through it. We're so busy comparing ourselves to the other women that we work with, that we don't share those experiences. I think as women, we need to try and be more understanding of other working women mm -hmm. and not judge them when we're having a bad day so when you come to work and you've got period pains share it bring that hot water bottle let everyone know mm -hmm. they must know and support you right or if you've been up all night because your child is sick okay and all they want is for you to hold them so you haven't slept but you still have to come to work like nothing happened mm -hmm that during that break, your lunch break, go to the car and take a nap. I think that's okay. It really is okay. We need to be kinder to ourselves. We need to take a breath. So now what I've done is I've actually set it on my Google calendar because if other people's appointments are so important and we put them on the calendar so we make sure we don't forget, why can't our appointments be as important or even more important so I've set it on the calendar and what I do is I like nature okay so during my break I find a time where I can sit and look outside at the trees um, I can look at pictures of nature and sometimes when I get really desperate I'll find a pot plant it's got a flower it's got a tree I look at that <laughs> And I just stop and take a breath. And I want all of you ladies to do that now. Can we all close our eyes for 10 seconds? Okay. I want you to keep your eyes closed. And I want to tell you guys that during this pause, the pauses that you take in your life, the breaths that you take, those moments where you lock yourself in the bathroom just for five minutes so no one disturbs you. It's in those pauses that you find inspiration. It's in that pause that you find motivation. That idea, that, that business idea, that's when you find it. You can open your eyes. That aha moment, that's when it happens. That, that thing that's been irritating you, 
you find the solution for it then. That is the time where you find your peace. And that is the time where you find you. So take that pause, that breath, put it in your phone, make sure that you make that appointment with yourself before you do anything else. And that's when you become innovative and appreciate the true you. Thank you, ladies. Wow. Now, I always say, whenever people call the doctor, they always have questions, right? And of course, how can I talk without answering any of these questions? <laughs> but the thing is, I know that in my profession, a lot of the questions that people want to ask me are a little bit personal, and people are too embarrassed to ask. So I asked Nompilo to ask the ladies um, on the chat group, on the business, the women in business group, if they had any questions, so it could be a little bit more anonymous, and we could talk about it. Mm -hmm. So there are three questions that were asked to me, and if maybe there are one or two, if we have time, you ladies or ladies on Zoom, if they wish to ask a question, they can and I will answer it. So the first question was, um, what is your journey and how did you, or your journey on how you got successful? It's a very long story, <laughs> but I will give you key pointers. Um, the first thing is that my father is an OBGYN. Okay, so I have basically grown up around medicine from the day I was born. Mm -hmm. My father used to pick me up, I would wait in his practice so I'll, you know, see his patients. I used to play with his equipment because I didn't have, you know, toys there with me. I thought they were very interesting. So it's been around me my whole life. When I was young, what I used to do, one of my favorite pastimes was, you know when you go to the pool and you see insects drowning and things like that? I used to save them. <laughs> and I used to, the ones that had died or didn't look like they were coming to life, I tried to sort of give them CPR. <laughs> so I would blow into them and, you know, let, let, hopefully see if they would um, come back to life. My sister, when we were young, my sister, we used to have a mango tree and an avocado tree. And during the season, her and I would collect all of those and sell them. Also our clothes, when we had outgrown them, still my sister would sell those clothes outside our house. Mm -hmm. my, my sister still does that now. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to say is that the things that we used to do when we were children, those things that came to us naturally, that we were unapologetic about, that we enjoyed and had fun doing, that often tends to be the thing that we're successful in yeah. as business. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, um, in terms of success, is, you know, I was so focused on my goal. I, I had this target that I wanted to do medicine and be a specialist and finish my specialization before I was 30. Those are my goals. And get a husband and have children. <laughs> and I was so focused on that goal that when I finally achieved it, it was a little bit of an anticlimax because I was like, is this it? <laughs> so everyone else thought I was successful and I knew I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. But I didn't feel happy inside. Mm -hmm. And I realized years later that it's because I was so focused on my goal that I forgot the other things that I enjoyed. My habits, playing musical instruments is what I used to do, exercising, reading books apart from medical books. I forgot to do those things. So I had focused all my attention on medicine and not on the other stuff. So don't forget the other stuff mm -hmm. when you get to your journey of success. And also that I've changed my definition of success because for me, I felt that success had to be the end point. But success is just a point mm -hmm. in your life. There are many moments where you will get that success. The other things I use, well, I think that's the third point, would be support. 
For example, my husband has been very, very supportive of my journey. We actually got married just as I started specializing. People, I think, used to think that I was a figment of my husband's imagination because I could never make any function. I was never there. He was always attending functions by himself. But support is important. Continuous learning, reading, but also reading outside your field of knowledge just to expand your horizons, I think that's important mm. as well. And finally, um, faith. My faith has helped me as well. Um, the next question that I was asked was how mm. I survived this dangerous condition that I had during pregnancy. Now, the condition that I have is called preeclampsia. It's when a woman gets high blood pressure, but it is literally caused by her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And that once the baby comes out, the high blood pressure goes away. Mm -hmm. So I had the worst form of it where it wasn't just high blood pressure, it came with all my organs that failed. Um, the only thing I can say is that it was through God's grace. I am a doctor now that believes in the supernatural healing power of God. Mm. Um, and I believe that God performed a miracle in my life by saving that of myself and of my son. There's nothing else I can say. Um, there's no medication for preeclampsia apart from delivering your baby and sort of hoping for the best for your patient. Um, yeah. So th that's all I can say about that. And then the third question, which is one I like. I said, yes, now ladies, we are talking. This is a question. How can we understand our bodies better as women so we don't frustrate our partners? I wanted to rephrase that and say, how can our partners understand our bodies better so they don't frustrate us. Yes. <laughs> now, this is a whole nother talk, but a few things. Firstly, is to understand the biology of our bodies as women. I want you all to go on to Google and Google the female vulva and vagina. Right now. There's a child, no, there's a child here, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. <laughs> Close his ears. <laughs> when you, and I want you to click the images part of it so that you can see what, I'm talking anatomically, okay? I'm not talking about funny sights, okay? <laughs> I want What's you to then. What would you do? The, the female vulva, that's V U L V A. And vagina, we all know how to spell that. Do we? <laughs> <laughs> and then you take a mirror and you look at yourself and you identify the different parts that are on the Google anatomical picture with your body. I find that because we cannot see what we have and we rely on other people to see it, that we don't actually know what we look like. Okay? The second thing I wanted to tell you ladies, and I, I drew, it's a graph, I hope you, <laughs> you'll be able to see it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Now this graph represents the sexual cycle or sexual response in women versus men. Okay. This is biology. Studies have been done on this. Now this dark one, if you look at this graph, okay, if you go across, this talks about time horizontally, okay? And if you look at the vertical axis, it talks about the stages that are reached, okay? Now this dark one here, that is a man's arousal and sexual cycle okay so I want you to take note of the time because mm. it's much shorter I'll get to the ladies now it starts here with desire 
at point zero goes to arousal, okay, it goes to climax, and then it goes to resolution. Very quick. Hmm? I just want you to look at that. Now the woman, <laughs> you see all the other lines? <laughs> That's a woman, okay? We've got so many variations and we're so complex. But the one thing I want you to take note of is the time yeah. that we take versus a man, okay? To get from the desire, the arousal, the peak or the climax, and the resolution. I want to emphasize that it takes time. Number two, that it's complex. There's so many dots, right? Mm -hmm. Confusing, okay? The one shows one where a woman actually will reach the peak and reach her resolution. The other one shows, and this is more common, is that the woman will reach her peak, but it takes much longer and goes down. And then there's one, and this is the most common one, where a woman will not actually reach the peak. She reaches, she goes to the arousal, the desire, the arousal, and then goes to a plateau, just a pleasant plateau, and then goes to a resolution where it goes down. What that means, and, and that's most women, that most women actually don't ever reach the climax. They don't reach the top. They get to the pleasant plateau and then it's done. Most women. Statistics tell us about 30 to 40 percent of women reach the peak. That means 60 percent of women in a lifetime will never reach the climax. Isn't that interesting? I said, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know our audience, but I'm going to say <laughs> one more thing. I, I debated whether I should say this or not, but I, I think I will. Is that the reason a lot of women feel, well, reach that plateau, that pleasant plateau, and then go to the resolution, is that society social media, internet, porn, has given us this idea that the only way most women reach their peak is through... Can you close his ears, please? <laughs> <laughs> through um, <laughs> vaginal or penetrative yeah. intercourse, mm. which is not true. Majority of women will reach their peak or climax through clitoral stimulation. Some women will need breast stimulation. Most people need a combination of clitoral, vaginal, and breast stimulation to reach that peak. The final thing I want to say, and I could say so much, but the <laughs> final thing I want to say is that because our graph is so much longer than a man's, a man is literally light switch on, because our time is so much longer that we do not rely on the arousal and desire stage to happen just in the bedroom, because that puts a lot of pressure on yourself and on your partner. You need to start that cycle outside of the bedroom with thoughts, whatever gets you going, okay? Romance, that's where the romance comes in. It's important so that you don't spend so much time and pressure on yourself in the bedroom trying to get to that peak. That's the end of my speech. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm saying it right. I see we have a lot of people on Zoom, but they haven't raised their hands or written any questions. Do we have any questions for our speakers from the floor? Yo, a lot. Or there is, bo- or can we go and then we go? Bongi. Bongi, yeah. Okay. It's for Dr. Current MP for you, my guy. And your dad was. Oh, <laughs> So um, it's just, you know, with regards to women after giving birth, vaginally, you know, the whole thing, you know, you hear of vaginal reconstruction and all of that. Um, how does that work? Does it take you back to a more tighter, do you enjoy it more? Uh, you know, is, some of the, is that really necessary or is just like something that's cosmetic that you can do if you want? It's important to do after giving birth. <laughs> okay. Um... What I want to say about that is that, you know, after having children, you know, so many women want to try to exercise and get everything back, but we often don't exercise the muscles that support the vagina. Those are the pelvic floor muscles. Now, the pelvic floor, if a woman pees, and in the middle of a pee, you're able to stop yourself from peeing. I didn't realize that that was a thing because men can't, they can't do that. So we have muscles called our pelvic floor that can be controlled and can be used to exercise that help with the restoration of the vagina after birth. So as much as you are doing your bicep curls, And as often as you are going to gym and walking and running, don't forget that there's that organ as well that needs to be recovered. So it involves, I I have a, actually, I do Pilates. (laughs) And my Pilates instructor says, imagine you're a jellyfish. (laughs) So what she says is that that action that you do when you hold yourself from peeing, You do that for 10 seconds, and then you release. You do that 10 times in a day. And then there's also one where you do fast ones, so you jellyfish in, out, in, out, 10 times a day as well. Now, with technology, things have also begun to advance because we have this new thing called aesthetic, aesthetic gynecology, okay? So just like how with um, skin and the beauty industry, people have started not, not necessarily doing facelifts, but doing things that can help tighten your skin on your face and make it look brighter. There are also things and technology that can be done down below that can also do that. There are machines that are used. Yes. <laughs> there are machines that are used, just like with your face, that are used, that can help tighten the area. Okay, so the first one is your, your non invasive, which is the exerciser that I talk about, your pelvic floor exercises. The next step, if people wish to go that way, is what I call the aesthetic gyne. Part. Okay, and then the final step is just like how you know when people do surgical interventions, you can have surgery done that will then bring things back together. But I, I want ladies to know that a lot of it is psychological, um, and that. Our partners are more forgiving than we think. And that actually you don't, you can't expect your body to go to exactly how it was before. Even when you exercise after having a child, 
as much work as you do, you look good, you still look good. But there is always a slight change. And we have to accept that. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thanks. Oh, I do have a question. Is there another? For Anne. Yes, there is a question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not a real question, it's a, it's a comment. Firstly, is to thank you for sharing your, your mental health journey. I've heard a lot of people speak around, you know, mental illness and depression, and they forget that it's important for us to fight the stigma. And how we fight the stigma is, first of all, sharing the experiences mm. and normalizing that depression does exist. Yeah. And when you spoke about your depression, obviously you were at a more severe, you know, but I think it's important to just, as ladies, as we speak about mental illness, to make ourselves aware that depression ranges. Yeah. And it's important for us to know that there's low depression. You know, just where you are still active, going to work, functioning, but you are still having those depressed mood and you're feeling a bit low and you're feeling like tired and you don't want to actually get up. And that's when it's really, really important to start to notice the change yes. and start to actually do something about it. Because when it comes to a point where you, you, you're now taking pills, you know, and it's, it, it's really is at a more severe state. Yeah. But depression happens to all, nearly all of us. Yeah. We've all had those down days, bad days, you know. We've all gone through those dips and we can't actually control circumstances and things are going to happen to us. We're all going to go through stuff that are going to pull us down. But this is the time for us to know before things happen, before things go out of hand, start skilling yourself. Mm. Start increasing your own coping skills. Start surrounding yourself with a good support system. You know, so I really, really enjoyed uh, both your <laughs> presentations. I'm sorry, my son, I had to Uber him, so I was so afraid and paranoid. I had to go out and just make sure he's okay. But thank you so much for that. Thank no. you, and, and I think your angle, especially, you know, when it comes to the whole topic, is, is just perfect. <laughs> thank you. Just, just perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And and Dr. Kuranteng, uh, Hepra. Hepra. Oh? Your father was my kind of <laughs> oh, 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 wow. Another one. Yeah, I had I had two miscarriages which he helped me through. And then I had four kids. Wow. So he's wow. my superstar. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'm glad you took his part. <laughs> Can I just say something that um Londega just spoke on is Sorry, you know, for me, um, because I was in denial, I saw the changes much earlier on. But you know, I was like, I have to fight, 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 fight. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. That's why, by the time I accepted and admitted what was really happening, it was then late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I said, you know yourself. You know, and maybe it can also be, maybe it's like how you were saying that it's um, reporting period at work. Mm. So you're really stressed out for the, like a month or two months. It's not really that you have clinical depression like now I've been diagnosed with. It's just, it's a stressful period. Yes, you might need some help during that time, but it's that time, you know, this, it's circumstantial. But if you can feel something is a bit off, immediately speak to someone and get help then. Then you don't have to wait until the point where I was in because it was too late for me to, oh, I can just talk about it, just go to therapy. I then had other, to use other interventions. Mm -hmm. There are two questions that side with. You can start, Cherise. Um, I think this may be open your answer. Um, so how uh, much of an effect does um, hormone levels have on Some people have even said that they've become suicidal at that time. So how much of 
that and should we be checking that, especially when we get older and uh, the hormones change? Okay. Um, what, what I wanted to say is that certainly there is a role that hormones play in terms of our moods. Um, I'll talk just generally for every woman, first of all. Um, specifically the time where you are about to have a period. The reason you have a period is because you're, okay, a woman has two hormones. The dominant ones are estrogen and progesterone. We all, we all have those hormones. And during the time of your period, your hormone levels drop. They, they, they almost just get switched off. Imagine a switch being just switched off. So there's a rapid drop in your hormone levels. And that's actually what causes you to have a period, is that there's no hormone that's feeding your womb anymore. So at that stage, that's often why people are, um, feel a bit, you know, emotional, a bit, you know, that's when you want the chocolates and <laughs> that kind of thing. It's because it's literally your hormone levels have dropped. Um, and that's often when people have what we call a dysphoric syndrome where instead of just that mood drop, you then start getting what we call a possible, I would call it a mental illness, but it, it does form under the DSM-4 classification.